This morning, as a surprise, I am coming to you, but I want you rest assured that you are missing out on nothing. Missing out on nothing. Why? Because pastor is going to bring the message next week that he wanted to preach. And I'm telling you this why, because this is going to bring a very, very important message for all of us. You know, how to have a happy family, home life, and he's going to give us really, really important topic. So if you are new to us today, there's a reason why you need to come back next week because he's going to bring that message to you all. And then of course, uh, we will continue to pray for Pastor Matt. And then today, we're going to talk about a message titled, Abraham's Children, the Inheritors of the World. How is your life? How are you doing? Is it easy to live your life, or is it difficult to live a life? In fact, most people in the world live a very, very hard life. Whether we live in America or in somewhere else in the world, we all have a very hard life life and so just make sure you know that you're not trying to escape america (laughs) to find a better place Uh, america is one of the best or better places to live despite all the struggles that we have on this land i can tell you as a person who was born outside this land and grew up there and of course south korea is a very good country as well Uh, Of course, many Koreans complain about our country, our government, our society. But if you compare America and South Korea to North Korea, (laughs) where I want to go, some, oh yeah, Siri is busy this morning. She did that uh, earlier this today. But uh, just, you know, America and wherever you may be in, you know, one of the most advanced countries, we are actually better off. Yet it doesn't guarantee that our life is still easy, right? But what's interesting is this. Almost everybody in the world, except for a few chosen people, you know, humanly speaking, uh, that everybody's having a hard life, yet it seems like to me that people, when they have hard things on their ways, they are so surprised <laughs> because they are having a hard moment. And especially it makes me a little, stops me and make me think that why, why Christians, especially Christians, are having so much trouble with the fact that we have hard life. You know, ever since the fall of our first parents, it was destined to us that we will have a hard life. And after the fall of Adam, the Lord told Adam that I cursed the ground so that the thorns and fiddles will come up as you sweat to your brow, as you try to earn bread, that you're going to suffer because of your sin. So having a hard life itself is not necessarily a problem. But as Christians, there's a bigger problem with us. What is it? It is this. As we are having a hard life, we live like losers in despair because of all those difficult things on our life journey. Why do we need to claim the name Christians when we act like the people in the world who don't believe in God when they fret, when they freak out, when difficult things come on their ways. I mean, why do we have to call ourselves Christians if we would act as if we are unbelievers? So today's message is really, really important. Why? Because as a preacher, I sometimes become so saddened when I think of the problem that many Christians have. The problem is this. Many believers live like losers in despair because of their hardness of life. And today's text text is really, really helpful. Why? Because in Romans 4, the Apostle Paul tells us of who we truly are in Christ. As the believers, as the people who have faith, like Abraham's faith, 
so that he calls us children of Abraham, that who we are in Christ really matters when it comes to the life we live on this earth. And more and further, the doctrine of justification or doctrine of salvation is not just about being forgiven and going to heaven. You know, so many of us who are conservative evangelical Christians, we have treated salvation as if it is something that beyond our life. Like we are waiting for the salvation and then it doesn't really affect our present life. It doesn't really comfort our hearts right now. It doesn't really encourage our hearts to live this life as victors. Then that's a big problem. Why? Because the Apostle Paul in today's text connects the two dots. Our justification. So we are justified by faith apart from works, just like Abraham was justified in, a, in Genesis 15, 6, that Abraham believed God's promise, so God counted his faith as righteousness. And we have that righteousness in Christ so we are justified. It means we are saved. We are sanctified. We have become the saints, the holy people of God. We are the children of God. Then that point needs to be connected to the another point that we are Abraham's children who have the entire world. And that's what I'm going to talk about. So today's thesis is we who are Abraham's children must live by faith as the inheritors of the world. So today's first point is this. As Abraham's children, we will inherit the world. Look at verse 13 again. For the promise that Paul is talking about the promise. This promise is the promise that God gave to Abraham in Genesis. The promise that he would, Abraham would be the heir of the world. This was the promise that God gave to Abraham according to Paul. But there is a little problem here. And I'm sure many of us, maybe probably most of us, have read through Genesis. Have you ever found a verse in Genesis that God tells Abraham, hey, Abraham, you're going to inherit, and your children will inherit the entire world? Did he promise that to Abraham? You know, when we look at, you know, the Genesis superficially, we don't really find those, that promise and to understand what Paul means here, that Abraham and his children become the heirs of the world, we need to first look at the three promises that God gave to Abraham. So Abraham received three promises from God. Let's go to Genesis 12. And Brother Joe read it today for us. Genesis 12, what you find is that God promises three things to Abraham. Genesis 12, verse 1. Now the Lord said, to Abraham, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that, will, that I will show you. So God is promising a land. We call it the promised land that is now, you know, residing in Israel, the land of Israel. And then if you look at verse 2, I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great. So he's, all, again, promising numerous descendants from Abraham. He's going to make a big nation. And later on, he continues saying, you're going to have a lot of nations through your blood. And then thirdly, God promises that Abraham will be a blessing. So through Abraham, all the nations will be blessed. So at the end of verse 2, and you shall be a blessing, and I'll bless those who bless you, and I'll curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So three things, you know, the, the land of Canaan, numerous descendants, and the blessing that will come through Abraham, especially God, you know, progressively reveals more that later, you're through your seed, that everyone in the world will be, every nation in the world will be blessed. And we all know that God kept all these three promises in both Israel's history and through his son, Jesus Christ. And Abraham, Abraham's one family <clears throat> became a huge family, millions of people, right? In a few hundred years after God promised to Abraham. Not only that, actually God gave Abraham many other nations, like through Ishmael. And Ishmael himself became a nation later. 
And then many people actually are, are, are not aware of this fact. But after Sarah died, uh, Abraham married to Keturah, and then she had six sons. So Abraham actually had eight sons biologically, and these six sons also became nations themselves. So God faithfully kept his promise to Abraham that he's going to have many, many, many descendants. And then also, you know, the promised land was given to Abraham and his children. Of course, Abraham didn't receive it in his lifetime, yet his children, of course, occupied that land. And we know from history. And also through, especially through Jesus Christ, the promise that every nation will be blessed through his seed is also kept. So Galatians 3, 13 and 14, Paul says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed to everyone who hangs on the cross. So his death on the cross fulfilled something in this verse 14, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So the seed of Abraham, who is Jesus Christ, came to die on the cross so that the blessing of Abraham would come to Gentiles, you like you and me. Is there any Jewish person in this room? Maybe not. Then we are all Gentiles, whether we are Americans, Indians, or Spanish, or Mexican, Hispanic, or Korean. We are all Gentiles. And the, the reason God sent Jesus Christ is to fulfill the promise, to keep the promise that he gave to Abraham 2,000 years before Jesus was born. And we can rest assured today that God truly, faithfully kept these promises. And when we look into God's promise to Abraham a little deeper, we also find a very interesting aspect. So let's go to Genesis 17. In Genesis 17, the Lord Yahweh is reaffirming his promise to Abraham. And if you look at verses 4 through 6, the Lord says, As for me, Genesis 17, 4, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, which means lofted or highly lifted father, but your name shall be Abraham, the father of many nations. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. So the promise that the kings shall come from Abraham in verse 6 were fulfilled by the historical fact that many nations came out of Abraham and those nations had many kings in them. That is the historical fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham. Yet, when we understand this truth in the light of the New Testament truth, it becomes obvious that the promise that king shall come from Abraham is not just applicable to, to those older the, the kings in the old history, but also it applies to us who are believers and the children of Abraham ourselves. So Abraham's children will receive the ownership and rulership of the world as kings. So to understand this reality, we uh, we need to talk about the broader storyline of the book of Genesis. So when the Bible says that we are created in the image of God, many people think that it means that we are like God in our reasoning, in our feeling, in our creativity, and things like that. And I do believe that it involves that aspect as well. But if you go to Genesis 1, verses 26 through 28, what you will find in terms of the being made in the image of God is something different. It's not just about our intellect, our emotions, and our will, but it actually has a very uh, specific connection. And that's, let, let's look at this. Genesis 1, verses 26 through 28. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. So we are made like God. Let them have what? Dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all, all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on earth. Do you see the connection here? 
So let's make them in our image and in our likeness. And then what is the function of that image? Let's have, let them have dominion over all the creatures in the world. Verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In, his, in the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Verse 28, then God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and what? Subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So what is the connection between the image of God and dominion over the world? They have really close connection here. The reason why God made us in his own image was to make us his co-regents who rule over the world as his representatives. So we are the ones who represent our creator to the world by our rulership over the world so that we can bring glory to God by just and fair and loving and gracious ruling over the entire world. But we know our first parents bombed it, right? They blew it. And of course, you know, Ariana nowadays, my daughter is nowadays, she's about seven, and she's wondering why, why Eve did that. I mean, she, Eve, only if Eve, Eve didn't do that. You know, I know some of us have thought that as well, but I can guarantee you, if you were Eve, if you were Adam, you would do the same. Because Adam and Eve were the best of us. They were intellectually, ethically, emotionally, the best, perfect human being, yet they failed without God's help. So then, that, you know, just don't worry about that. But anyways, Adam and Eve failed. So then, what's the implication of that? Of course, as Christians, we know it means that we are sin-stricken. So we have to go to hell, right? I mean, so, so many Christians only think in that note. But actually, we, have to, we need to think it beyond that. Why? Of course, it is true that we are sin-stricken. We are sin-cursed. We have to go to hell because of our sins. Yet at the same time, what, they, what Adam and Eve lost wasn't just the, the, the holiness, the purity. But what they lost was the dominion over the world. And who gained that dominion over the world now? <laughs> Satan, the prince of the air. That's why he's called the prince of the air. He has the authority over the world in, of course, controlled way by God. Yet anyone is, he, he got that dominion from Adam. So Adam was dethroned as God's co-regent. And then Satan became that. That's what we lost as humans. God created us as kings, and we lost that rulership in Adam. So, the story goes, after Adam and Eve, Genesis 4, who appears? Cain and Abel, Abel in a horrible murder. And then what comes after that? The people are just don't care. They don't, didn't care about God and the Tower of Babel, and the confusion of languages. That's why I, it's, it took me so hard to learn your language here and speak, preach this language you know, like this, and it took, took me quite a bit. Uh, but you know, all the, the, the human history just was going south. You know, so bad, ugly, gloomy. And then, of course, the, the flood. So then the, did the flood take care of everything? No, after the flood, people began to we fruitful, yet they weren't really caring for God. And then we go to Genesis 12, and we find the name Abram. And God chose Abraham, and he called him out of Ur in uh, Babylonia, right now, not, not, okay, Iran, you know, Iraq, Iraqi area. And then he brought him to the promised land. Why? That was the, the, the beginning point of God's redemption for humanity. So when God called Abraham out of the pagan world, it wasn't just because he wanted to save us from our sins and save us from hell. But what God intended out of calling Abraham was to restore our image of God. What is that again? To have dominion over the world. And that is the theme that goes through from Genesis to Revelation. 
if you read the Bible carefully with that lens, you will find that Adam and Eve were created as kings, and then they lost that dominion, and then God's redeeming story is the story that God redeems our rulership back through who? The Lord and King Jesus Christ. Jesus came to the earth as the king. And that's, you know, we, we find that aspect throughout the Gospels, right? Jesus Christ, the son of Abraham and David, Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. But if you look at the Greek text, actually David comes first, not Abraham. So David is more important to Matthew about Jesus. Why? David was the king. He wasn't just a king, but David was the type of the coming king, the messianic king. So the messianic king was called the Davidic king, right? Davidic king. Why? Because he's going to be the king according to the example of David, the most glorious history of the kingdom of Israel. And of course, this Messiah will fulfill it much greater way. And that's why we call Jesus the king of kings and lords of lords. That's what you find in book of Revelation. So from the beginning to the end, it's about the kingship of God, kingship of the Lord Jesus Christ. And after his resurrection, the Lord Jesus Christ gave us the great commission in Matthew 20, 28, 19, and 20. You know, go away, therefore, you know, make disciples of all nations and baptize them and teach them all the things I've taught you. But right before that, verse 18, what did he say as he was giving the great commission? All authority in heaven and earth is given unto who? Me. So I am the king the rightful king. I was the king, but through my death and resurrection, I affirmed it. So I have every right of rulership over the world. So as you are my disciples, or as you are my co-regents, with my authority, go to the world and expand my rulership over the world. That's what God said. To Adam, hey, I created you so that you can expand my dominion over the world. And that's what Jesus was doing in Matthew 28. I am the king. I'm giving it to you again. Adam blew it, blew it, but I fulfilled it. And so you with my authority, under my authority, go into the world and proclaim the kingship of mine. I am the king. Jesus is the Lord. That is the, the, the core content of the gospel. And then we are exercising that authority as Christians. And, and so we are not just his envoys, but we also share his rulership, his heirship. That's what Paul is all about. You know, Romans, when we talk about Romans, we only talk about, sometimes we talk Romans road, right? I mean, you, know, you, all, you all have seen and come short of the glory of God. You know, but the gift of God is Jesus through Jesus Christ, you know, and we, we just only talk about the salvation aspect, you know, being saved from hell and sin. It is true and that's valuable. There's more than that. Let's go to Romans 8. The, 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 the meaning of justification is not just being saved from hell and sin, but it is the restoration of the rulership of the world. Romans 8, verses 16 and 17, the apostle Paul says, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. You see? We are children of God. If children, then what? Heirs. Heirs with who? Heirs of, heirs of God and join heirs with Christ. Join heirs with Christ. We are not just below Christ. Yes, we are below him forever. Yes, somehow out of his infinite grace, God made us who heirs with Christ. Christ, indeed, if indeed we suffer with him, that we also be, may be glorified together. Do you know what it means? It means that we are going to share the glory that Jesus has right now with us. The exact same glory. The exact same glory is ours. It's promised. It's guaranteed by the seal of the Holy Spirit. There's no turning back. God promised it. God affirmed it. And he said it over and over again. So that who are we in Christ? Be co-heirs with Christ. What does Christ have? All authority in heaven and earth is given unto me. That rulership is shared with us. Of course, I want to be careful here. We are not becoming like Christ. 
ruling over everything like Christ rules, so yet somehow the, he's sharing the benefits of his rulership with us. And they even calls us his co-heirs. And if you, if you go to 2 Timothy 2 or 12, Paul also says if we endure right now on earth in our hard life, we shall also reign with him. Yet if we deny Christ, he also will deny us. You see here? If we endure for the sake of Christ on earth right now, what's going to happen when Christ comes back? We are going to reign with Christ. Again, the rulership, the ownership of the world. We are the king, the core regions with Christ. And then 1 Peter 2, 9 through 10. Let's go there. This is an important passage. 1 Peter 2, verses 9 and 10. Here, the apostle Peter is trying to soothe the hearts of the believers who are going through a severe persecution. These believers were cast away. Nobody liked them. They lost their houses. Some of them lost their family members. And they're in great sufferings. But look at the way Peter describes them. 1 Peter 2.9, But you are a chosen generation and a royal priesthood. You know, there's a song that talks about this reality. You sometimes just sing it without thinking deeply about it. But we have to stop here. These people are suffering, right? They're like treated like dirt in the world. They're treated like trash in the world. Nobody cared for them. Yet Peter is looking into their eyes and says, Hey guys, you are the chosen generation by God. And you are the royal priest. What does that mean? You are the kings and priests. You are the priestly king. You are the kingly priest. You share both. You know, in the Old Testament, kings couldn't be priests. Priests couldn't be kings. But somehow in Christ, we are both kings and priests. He's not using the future tense here. He's saying we are right now royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praise of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people. We were not a people. We had no value in us, yet because of Christ, but I now the people of God who have not obtained mercy, but now have obtained Mercy. Now, can you see why the Apostle Paul in Romans 4 said that God promised Abraham and his seed that they will inherit the entire world? Now, this is the storyline of the Bible. We lost the dominion, but with the call of Abraham, all the promises that were given to Abraham, we could anticipate if we were living in the Old Testament that God is going to restore this dominion for us. Through his Messiah. And who's the Messiah? Jesus Christ, the seed of Abraham. So within him, we become heirs with Christ. So by turning us from rebellious sinners into God's royal children in Christ, God has accomplished his original plan in the Garden of Eden that humans would be rulers over the world. Do you know that? You know, God never fails. For now, it seems he's, he's failed, right? I mean, the world, look at the world, it's so ugly. Look at the politics that are utilized by the government here. And in South Korea, same thing, actually. It's not that different. You know, don't, don't ever feel like you are the only people who are suffering by your government. <laughs> there are many whole groups of people out there who are suffering more than we suffer. But it's ugly. It's really this, you know, gloomy, discouraging. Yet, God has never failed. With the coming of his son, Jesus Christ, it's already done. All authorities in heaven and earth was given unto him. He's ruling over the world right now, and he's calling us the royal priesthood. We are the kings and priests in Christ. So let's go to Galatians 2, 3. So the apostle Paul is affirming this truth again, Galatians 3, 26 through 29. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Again, remember, the, the, the fact that you know, we are justified is not just about that we are saved from hell, but it's more than that. We are becoming the children of God. So verse 27, for uh, children of Abraham, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ has put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, 
then you are Abram's seed and heirs according to the promise. Again, what's the promise? The promise that was given to Abraham. That through you, all nations receive blessing. And what is the blessing? The heirship over the world. The rulership, the ownership over the world. But you may say, hey, Pastor Joe, look at my life. It's miserable. I don't feel like I'm a king. I don't feel like I'm the heir. But we are believers. We believe something that is not visible. You may feel like you're losers. You may feel like you are just dirt in the world. But in God's sight, you are heirs. Why? Because God cannot break his promise. He promised to Abraham, I'm going to make you and your children the heirs of the world, the rulers of the world. And that was exactly fulfilled in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Then how did we become Abraham's children who are the heirs of the world? Point number two, as Abraham's children, we will inherit the world by the righteousness of faith apart from the law. Let's go back to Romans 4 again. Romans 4, verses 13 through 15. And there we find that God's promise to Abraham were fulfilled by the righteousness that comes by faith. Verse 13, for the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. So, you know, just being justified by faith apart from works is not just about our soul salvation, it's a spiritual salvation, but this is the fulfillment of the promise given to Abraham that we are becoming the heirs of with Christ. The Abraham's circumcision was the seal, according to verse 11, Abraham's circumcision was the seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was not still, uns- was still uncircumcised. So Abraham actually was justified in Genesis 15:6 as an uncircumcised person, so as a Gentile. So that's po- what Paul, Paul argues throughout Romans 4. So that you who are uncircumcised, Gentiles, you are the children of Abraham, according to his pro- uh, example. Why? Because just as he was justified apart from circumcision, apart from the law, by faith, you are justified by faith apart from the works. So you and Abraham have the same root. You are in one family. So that's what Paul is arguing here. And then God's promise is fulfilled apart from the works, verses 14 and 15. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of no effect, because the law brings about wrath. For there, where there is no law, there is no transgression. So Abraham was justified when he was not circumcised. And circumcision is the symbol that represents the law. In other words, the fact that Abraham was justified as an uncircumcised person effectively demonstrates the truth that God's people enter a covenant relationship with God apart from the law. So in verse verse 14, Paul clearly states that relying on the law makes faith, law, and promise void. It is because such an action directly goes against the example of Abraham, who is the father of all believers. Further, those who attempt to come to God through the law bring wrath to themselves, according to verse 15. It means that those who establish their own righteousness by the law will only be exposed as transgressors of the law. Paul's words in verse 15, where there is no law, there is no transgression, does not mean that sin didn't exist before the law was given. But look at the way Paul uses the terms, the terminology here. He didn't say where there's no law, there's no sin. But he said, rather said, where there's no law, there's no transgression. What does that mean? It means this. Transgression means a direct violation of God's law. So before the law was given, sin still existed. Yet that sin transformed when the law was given. How? I sinned against God, and as the law was given, this person who sinned against God realized, oh, I particularly sinned against this point in God's law. So this person before the law was given was just a sinner, simple sinner who deserves that. 
But after the law was given, now I have many records. <laughs> Not just I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner with many, many, many records that cannot be blotted away from my record. It is engraved in my birth certificate that this person is this, 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 this 613 points of sinner. That's what the law did. So law was given so that the sinner and the sin, his sinfulness would be more magnified. So that, you know, Paul already concluded in Romans 3. I'm, I'm sure many of us already know that there's no righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's, it means that. I mean, the, the law, through the law, there's nobody who will be justified by, uh, by God. But rather is through faith, according to the example of the Lord, uh, Abraham, our father in the Old Testament. So one of the reasons God gave the law was to make sin more sinful. So that's something that we have to keep in mind. So that's why we shouldn't go to God through the law, but rather we should go to God through faith as the example was given by uh, Abraham, our father. Let me read Galatians 3, 10, 3, 11 again. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, as it is written, Curse is everyone who does not continue. Actually, I didn't read it. I thought I read it, but it's Galatians 3, 10, 11. Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law and do them. So if you continue to justify yourself before God by keeping the law, all you do is cursing yourself. Verse 11, but no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident for the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. That is what Paul is emphasizing in Romans 4. Those who share the faith of Abraham shall live by faith in their life on earth. And what does that mean? Being just, you know, we, the just shall we live by faith. It first means that we are justified by faith in our conversion, right? And our salvation moment. And it doesn't stop there. Those who are justified just like Abraham was justified by faith, will continue to live their lives by faith. That's what it means there. So point number three, as Abraham's children, we must live by faith that Abraham had. Let me say it again. As Abraham's children, we must live by the faith that Abraham has. So Romans 4, verses 16 and 17. Therefore, it is all faith that it might be according to grace so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. So what Paul describes us is this. We are the people who have the exact faith that Abraham had. So just like Abraham lived by faith, we must Live by faith. So that's what Paul says. Abraham lived by faith. That's so, so obvious. So he obeyed God's call to leave his country and come to the promised land. That's Genesis 12. And Abraham obeyed God's command to be circumcised. On the very same day, he received that, uh, that command in Genesis 17. And then he also obeyed God's command to offer his most precious son, Isaac, in Genesis 22. So his life is characterized by obedience. How could he do that? By faith. Because he believed. And that's the, what the author of Hebrews says. Hebrews 11, 8, and 9. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob and heirs with him of the same promise. And verse 17 of Hebrews 11, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And, the, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. The only reason Abraham could obey God in the way he did was because he believed in God's promises. That was the only reason. And he had a hard life, yet he didn't live like a loser in despair because he was waiting for a city that God would give to him. So he lived like a victor when his life was so hard 
just because he had faith in God's promises. So Hebrews 11.10 pro, tells us the promise that Abram had. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. So he was waiting for the coming city. Verse 13, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. That's, what, that's how Abraham lived. He lived as a stranger and pilgrim. You know, when we look at these words, we take it, light, take it lightly, but in the past, being pilgrim and stranger is, was an endangerment of your life wherever you went. There was no law that protected you there. Yet he was willingly taking that position. Why? Because he believed in God's promise. And verse 16 of Hebrews 11, but, but now they this desire better, that is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. So that was the hope that Abraham had. He was looking for the coming city. So as the children of Abraham, we must live our lives in the same way, by faith. So then what does it mean that we live by faith? It means that just as Abraham did, we live a life of obedience to God because we believe in him. So just like Abraham was looking for a city that God promised to him, we must live our lives with hope for the same city. And that's what the author of Hebrews says. Hebrews 13, 14. For here, we, here including us, we have no continuing city on earth, but we seek the one to come. So we share not just the faith that Abraham had, but we share the same hope that Abraham had. Abraham was waiting for the city, and we are waiting for the city. Why? Because this promise was given to both Abraham and us, who are children of God. So when we live like our father Abraham, even when our life becomes hard and we cannot see the immediate future clearly, we will not live like losers, but like winners who obey God while filled with hope. It is because, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, uh, 5, 7, we walk by faith, not by sight. So their problem, again, there's a still a problem. Many believers live like losers in despair because of the hardness of life. Yet, remember, if you are children of Abraham, you are better than Elon Musk. You're better than Jeff Bezos. You're better than Warren Buffett. You're better than Bill Gates. You're better than Mark Zuckerberg. You're better than Tim Cook. Why? They don't have this promise. They, they are oblivious to the fact that there's a city that is coming. Yeah, we all know that. And we have that hope, just like Abraham had that hope. So we are Abraham's children who must live by faith victoriously as the in inheritors of the world. And some people say that if they could go back to a certain moment of their past, they would go back to the moment when Google and Amazon were started. Why? Because if you buy their stocks, you will soon become billionaires, right? Whenever I see people say that, I laugh at it, I smile at it. And then I think about the moment that when, the Christ, when the Christ comes back. When this, this promise is realized, that the fact that we are heirs of the world, according to the example of Abraham, that we are the rulers of the world, that we have the dominion over the world as co-regents with Christ, that when that reality is physically displayed, what will I regret? Regret them. What will, will I regret? I think I know what I'm going to regret. I'm going to regret that in 2013, Joseph Cho because of the hard life, he was discouraged. He was tearing up. He was complaining. He was like hopeless. He was living his life in 2023 like a loser when he was the winner. That's what I'm going to regret when Christ comes back. That's something we all have to remember. I know some of you are going through really, really hard time in your life. Relationship problems, financial problems, health problems. I do feel the pain as your pastor, as your assistant pastor. Yet, I want you to know at the same time, 
if we just are just so discouraged and living and acting like losers today, we will regret when Christ comes back. Why did I do that? When this is the reality, we walk by faith, not by sight. And our faith will become our sight, the reality. So dear folks, what you see with your eyes right now, the reality that we see in the world, is fake. It will be thrown into the trash when Christ comes back. And he's going to roll out the true reality that we are the co-heirs with Christ, the co-regions with Christ, that we are better than all the billionaires, all the kings, and all the politically powerful people. Then why should we live like losers? Let's live like victors by faith today. Let's pray. Gracious Father, thank you so much for your love to us. Lord, I can feel your heart right now based on your word, the revelation, that I know you have pity on us. You have compassion on us. You're not laughing at us. You're not sneering at us when we struggle, when we are depressed, when we are living like losers. But rather, we, I know you want to encourage our hearts. So, Lord, that's what I did this morning. Why? I didn't know even at, until 7.30 in this morning that I would bring this message to our people here. Yeah, you knew it, and I know you knew that our people needed it this morning. So, Lord, I pray. It's your time, Lord. You may work mightily in their hearts right now. And some of us are so hurting. Some of us are so discouraged. Yeah, Lord, this truth will be used by your powerful spirit that it will encourage their hearts. And they will live their day to day as victors with joy, with hope, just like Abraham did 3,000 years ago because we are his children and because we are your children. And as the piano is being displayed, being, being played, please bring your thoughts and request to the Lord and ask God to encourage your hearts with